Hello viewers and learners, uh, we were discussing the world systems theory. So, in the second part of the lecture, I am going to discuss with you some of the key arguments, some of the features of the world systems theory and also some of its limitations. The new world economy that emerged was, here I am talking about the world system, it differed from previous empires in that sense that it coexisted with a multiplicity of political jurisdictions and was characterized by a new international division of labor between core and periphery. So, if we compare the new world system with the previous empires, there were a lot of distinctions. One of the distinctions was that now in the modern system, different kind of political systems, they coexist together. And uh, within that coexistence of multiple political structures, there was a broad division and that was a division of labor between the core countries and the peripheral countries. Now, here it is very important to understand what is the meaning of say the core countries or the peripheral countries. Later on, one more thing was added to it, one more category was added to it and that was the semi-peripheral countries or semi-peripheral states. So, here let us first discuss the core countries or the core. So, the core here refers to those regions that benefited most from the changes that were coming from 15th century onwards. In the period of initial expansion, this included most of northwestern European states such as France, England and Holland. The region was characterized by strong central government and large mercenary armies. The later enabled the bourgeoisie to control international commerce and extract economic surplus from trade and commerce. Now, the changes, the broad changes that were coming in the economic system, it leads to a lot of changes in the political system also. For example, in European countries, now the central governments are becoming more and more powerful. Now the European countries, they have started giving a lot of importance to having very strong and powerful armies. Now these armies in the state, they were broadly used by the bourgeoisie class of those states to take a, a kind of say global control of international commerce and to extract maximum profit from international trade and commerce. The growth of urban manufacturing was fed by movement of landless peasants from the countryside to the cities, whilst improvement in agricultural technology continues increases in agricultural productivity. So, here there are two things which are notable. Uh, these changes, they can also be seen in the pattern of uh, say infrastructure development uh, in European countries. It leads to a growth uh, of urbanization. So, a lot of urban new centers or new cities, uh, they come up in European countries. Uh, largely, it happened because of the reason that landless peasants, they have started moving from countryside to cities because they have to work in those industrial centers, in those factories, etc. Whether all these, I mean, all these changes at one hand were coming, and uh, because of the technological advancement, all, even in the field of agriculture, it also leads to uh, an increase in agricultural productivity. The core countries are those countries where capital is always concentrated in its most sophisticated forms. So, they have come up with uh, many financial institutions or modern banking systems and they have also come up with uh, you know many new kind of professions, educational fields, trading activities. They also started focusing on still skilled manufacturings right? and gradually they have spread across a large part of European countries and that is the reason that uh, all the modern courses that we see around the world today. Uh, if you see their origin, then many of them were started in European countries and uh, they were started because uh, they have to facilitate, uh, you know, the changing nature of global economy. When we talk, uh, talk about the peripheral countries, uh, they are, uh, you know, in contrast to core countries. 
So peripheral countries or the periphery refers to regions lacking strong central governments. They are largely dependent on coercive rather than wage labor. And those economic depend those economies depended upon the export of raw materials to the core. So here there are three things which are notable. One thing is that they were not having very strong central governments. It means that their political structures were not very strong and uh, their governing structures were also not very strong. Second thing is that they were primarily dependent on wage labor, so they were not enjoying or having any kind of military or coercive power. Third thing is they were economically again dependent on the export of raw materials to the core countries. Latin America and Eastern European countries were key peripheral zones in the 16th century. In the periphery, extensive cultivation and coercive control of labor achieve low-cost agricultural production. So, in the peripheral countries, uh, I mean the practices of cultivation or uh, how to use the labor, right? How to how to get the work done? Uh, it was done at a very low cost, and uh, uh, the practices were quite manipulative in nature. Now we'll discuss about the semi-peripheries. Palestine also refers to semi-peripheries uh, as well as uh, in external areas. So semi-peripheries were either the regions that could be geographically located in the core, but were undergoing a process of relative decline. So here the examples that can be taken is of Spain and Portugal. There can be other countries, for example, the rising economies that can be also put in that category of uh, semi-periphery. So earlier those countries were part of the periphery, but uh, because of a rapid boom in their economies, they can became part of the semi-peripheral states. So suppose if we apply this hypothesis in modern times, then we can even call India as semi-peripheral states. They were exploited by the core, but in turn took advantage to the periphery. So gradually there was a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a relationship where core countries, they try to exploit the semi-peripheral countries, but as and when they get a chance, they also try to make uh, advantage of the si situation or their relationship with the core states. According to Wellerstein, the semi-peripheral zones, they have an intermediate role within the world system displaying certain features or say characteristics of the core and other characteristics of the periphery. So semi-peripheral states, they have the characteristics of both the core countries and the peripheral countries. And that is the reason that Wallerstein called them as uh, that they have an intermediate role because they have the characteristics of both core and periphery. Uh, here we can also talk about some of the features uh, based on which we can identify like which countries uh, can be put in that category of semi-peripheral states or what could be like their, uh, their, their main characteristics. So here the first one is that although uh, core, uh, I mean semi-peripheral countries, they were dominated by core economic interest. Uh, they have their own relatively vibrant indigenously owned industrial base. So they have their own indigenous industrial base also. When they have to deal with the core countries, definitely the core countries have an upper hand, but it does not mean that they were not having their own industries at all. So they were having their indigenous industrial base. Because of this hybrid nature, the semi-periphery plays an important economic and political role within the modern world system. Second thing is, it provides a source of labor that contracts any upward pressure on wages in the core and also provides a new home for those industries that can be no longer function profitably in the core. So over the period of time in developed countries, now here I am referring, uh, I mean using the term developed countries in the context of the core countries. So over the period of time in core countries, it has been realized that some of the industries they are not profitable, that much profitable if they were run in the core countries itself. Uh, the labor is also very high there. So what they have decided is that they have to shift to those industries in some semi-peripheral zones. 
uh, there are two primary reasons for that. One is that in the semi-peripheral zones, uh, they were having skilled labor. The second reason is that uh, they were also acting as a market, right? And apart from that, uh, it is easy for them to get, uh, you know, settle those industries there and run them profitably. The semi-periphery is assigned a specific economic role, but the reason is less economic than political. So here it has been argued by Wellerstein that one might make a good case that the world economy would function every bit as well without a semi-periphery, but it would be far less politically stable for it would mean a polarized world system. The existence of the third category means precisely that upper stratum is not faced with the unified opposition of all others because the middle stratum is be both exploited and exploited. Now, it is very important uh, to note here that uh, the semi-peripheral countries, they have a very important political role. They provide stability to the world system. Now, how they provide stability to the world system? If there will be a broad division only between core and periphery, then the peripheral countries, they might realize their disadvantageous position and condition and they may try to destabilize the world system. So here comes the role of semi-peripheral states that provide stability to the system because if you see their nature, then they are between core and periphery. Right, and uh, if you see their uh, position or how they operate, then they can be called both uh, as being exploited and they also uh, can also be referred as exploiter. So, they are better placed than the peripheral countries, but uh, still they are not uh, equally positioned with the core countries. According to the world system theorist, the three zones of the world economy are linked together in an exploitative relationship in which wealth is drained away from the periphery to the center. As a consequence, the relative position of the zones become even more deeply entrenched. The rich, they get more richer, while the poor became more poorer. And this is the question that uh, around the world uh, uh, the experts in the field of economy, they are trying to explore that how it is happening that the rich are becoming more richer and it is not just uh, country specific. I mean, around the world, within country and uh, across states, uh, the condition is more or less same. Now, there are two type of uh, dimensions in the world systems theory. One is the geographic dimension and the other one is the temporal dimension. So, now we will discuss both uh, the geographic dimension and the temporal dimension. So, when we talk about uh, the geographic dimension, together uh, the core, semi-periphery and periphery, they make up the geographic dimension of the world economy that can be called as one system. So, geographically, all the countries, core countries, semi-peripheral countries, peripheral countries, they make up a geographical dimension which is broadly known or that can be called as the world system. When we talk about the temporal dimension, it means that in order to understand the dynamics of their interaction over time, we must turn our attention to the temporal dimension of Wellerstein's description of the world economy and how he has described these temporal dimension of world economy, that there are cyclical rhymes, there are secular trends, there are contradictions and crises. So, world system, it passes through all these temporal dimensions. It is these when combined with the spatial dimensions, which determine the historical trajectory of the system. Now, let us discuss uh, the temporal dimensions. The first temporal dimension is cyclical rhymes. It is concerned with the tendency of the capitalist world economy to go through recurrent period of expansion and subsequent contraction or more colloquially we can call it boom and bust. It means that there were a lot of ups and downs in the world economic system. 
Sometimes there was a phase of recession, sometimes there was an upward trend that can be seen in international economy. Second thing which is the secular trend, it refers to the long term growth or contraction of the world economy. It means that when uh, broadly, largely, uh, without any kind of disturbances, the world economy functions smoothly, then it can be called a secular trend where everything goes smoothly without uh, much disturbances. The third temporal feature of the world system is contradictions. These arises because of constraints imposed by systemic structures which make one set of behavior optimal for actors in the short run and a deferred even opposite set of behavior optimal for the same actors in the middle run. Wallerstein, uh, you know, he said that one of the central contradiction is under consumption. Now here, if you see the operating nature of world systems, then different set of behaviors, different kind of norms are applicable on the core countries and the peripheral countries. It means that there is as such no uniformity, there is no equality in terms of uh, uh, the exchange or in terms of how they deal with each other. Right? So, there are different kind of norms which are uh, for the core countries and there are altogether different kind of norms for the peripheral countries. Apart from that, in the short run and the longer run, and in the longer run, again there are different kind of rules and regulations. Wellerstein has highlighted uh, that underconsumption is uh, one of uh, one of such kind of contradictions. Now, underconsumption refers to the situation where it is in the interest of capitalist to have well-paid workers so that they can consume the items that they produce. It is also in their interest to reduce wage level in order to increase profitability. So, it leads to a kind of deadlock. Uh, I mean, what they should prioritize more. On one hand, they want the workers to consume the products that they are producing. On the other hand, they also have to focus on their wages. But if they increase the wages, then it will lead to a decrease in profitability, which they never prefer. In practice, it is not possible to fulfill both of these aims. The pressure of the capitalist system means that to remain profitable, capital, uh, capitalists uh, seek to reduce wages, though this also reduces consumption. The fourth one is crisis. It constitutes a unique set of circumstances that can only be manifested once in the lifetime of a world system. So, it is a rare occurrence. It occurs when the contradictions, secular trends and cyclical rhymes combined in such a way to mean that the system cannot continue to reproduce itself. So, here previously we discussed that uh, continuously the world system politically, economically it produces and reproduces itself. But uh, at the time of crisis, there will come a situation when that uh, world capitalist system fail to reproduce itself. So, it leads to a crisis within a particular world system that heralds its end and uh, it may lead to the replacement of that system by another system. So, Wellerstein, he also gave some of his uh, concluding remarks uh, regarding the world systems theory. According to Wellerstein, the capitalist world system, while it may continue for some time yet, is characterized by some fundamental contradictions which will ultimately bring about its demise even as it appears to consolidate its global control. So, on one hand, if we look at the world capitalist system, it seems that everything is going on quite smoothly. But according to Wellerstein, uh, this is not the case because uh, the world uh, system or the world economic system, capitalist system, it has certain fundamental contradictions and uh, uh, those contradictions will someday lead to its demise. So, here there are certain things that he has highlighted. First is that there is continuing imbalance between supply and demand. So, long as decisions about what and how much to produce is made at the level of the firm, the imbalance will be an unintended consequence of continuous mechanization and commodification. Second, 
whereas in the short run it is rational for capitalists to make profits by withdrawing the surplus from immediate consumption in the longer term the further production of surplus requires a mass demand which can only be met by redistributing the surplus so redistribution of surplus became important here it means that uh, uh, the present system which is exploitative in nature it cannot continue in future without uh, having some proper adjustments third is that there are limits to the degree to which the state can co-opt workers to maintain the legitimation of the capitalist system and finally and most significantly uh, there is the contradiction between the one and the many the existence of a plural state system within world system while this facilitates the expansion of the system it also impedes any attempt to develop greater cooperation to counter systemic crises in the system as a whole so here if we look at the nature of political systems around the countries in the world uh, so there are different uh, kind of political systems existing for example there are certain countries which are authoritarian in nature in some countries there are military dictatorship in some countries there is a theocracy in some other states uh, i mean the economy is comparatively more open if we talk about uh, uh, the economic side of it in some other states the economy is still controlled by the state itself uh, i mean the primary purpose of saying this is that uh, if you see the international system or the countries in the international systems they have lot of diversity both politically and economically so they cannot act as a united force if any kind of crisis will come in the world system right because they have a uh, different kind of political systems and uh, their capacity to respond to the crisis is also different and uh, they also have different economic interests because all the countries are not equally placed adequately placed in the world system wallerstein argues that the end of the cold war rather than making a triumph of liberalism he said that it indicates its immediate device uh, demise sorry so here uh, wellerstein is giving a very uh, radical statement that uh, uh, you know when with the end of cold war the entire world or uh, the liberal scholars they were of the opinion that uh, it is a triumph of liberalism so here we can also refer to francis fukuyama when he said that it it can be seen as an end of history right so wellerstein says that uh, it shouldn't be seen as a triumph of liberalism rather it is indicating that now the demise of world capitalist system or world system it is imminent it is coming nearer this has sparked a crisis in the current world system that will involve its demise and replacement by another system so because of uh, uh, the disintegration of soviet union because of the end of cold war the balance that was existing is now no more and ultimately it will also lead to a crisis in the current world system period of crisis is also a period of Uh, is also a time of opportunity so whenever a crisis came it also comes with a lot of opportunities so when a system is in operation operating smoothly behavior is very much determined by its structure in a time of crisis however actors have far greater agency to determine the character of the replacement of structure so in normal times everything works smoothly but uh, it all depends like uh, whenever a crisis will come how the countries will respond to that crisis so according to wellerstein it may lead to the replacement of that entire structure altogether now this was uh, uh, the world systems theory uh, that was largely elaborated explained by wellerstein it ha- it is an important theory in the field of international relations but it also has its own criticisms one of the criticism is given by socialist scholars those who believe that radical reform is still possible within the boundaries of the state so here they want to focus on single states rather than uh, going for a macro level analysis of the world system and bringing about a total transformation right so the socialist scholars they believe that uh, 
radical reforms in the economic system they are still possible within the boundaries of state it is very much possible second thing is that the present world system it is far more diverse and complex and it is altogether different than that has been elaborated by the scholars who are associated with world systems theory so the present world system is comparatively far more diverse in countries they they are at various levels and then there is also internal mobilization in their position third is the rigidity of the core semi periphery and periphery mode it fails to account for some of the anomalies such as the rise of some of the states to core status like japan there can be many such examples right so the countries that were elaborated as the core countries over the period of time it has been seen that many other countries they have also uh, having similar features such as the core countries but uh, they were not explained and uh, it was not even predicted uh, the similar situation can also be seen in case of the peripheral countries and semi peripheral countries so some of the peripheral countries now they became part of semi periphery and some of the peri- semi peripheral states are a uh, very you know at a very fast pace they are moving towards uh, becoming a core country uh, next criticism is that uh, uh, the world systems theory it gives a lot of emphasis on economy particularly when they talk about the internal contradictions of capitalism so it seems that it has been exaggerated so it has been predicted time and again that capitalism is going to end but that is not the case so if you look at uh, 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 the world uh, today it seems that capitalism is growing and it is still very much uh, intact right and uh, there are not many challenges as such so ups and downs keep coming but still it is comparatively stable apart from that world systems theory is also criticized on the ground that it has made some failed predictions regarding the demise or the collapse of uh, capitalism or the world systems so they have predicted it from the time of lenin when he said that uh, imperialism is going to be the highest stage of capitalism so from that time onwards a number of scholars they have predicted uh, the demise or the collapse of capitalism but uh, most of these predictions they failed uh, so despite uh, all these criticisms we can still say that uh, world systems theory it is an important contribution in the field of international relations and uh, it has its own place and it gives us an alternative perspective to look at the world the countries and international system thank you